I just briefly like to answer a question I did not really uh, expect to hear so often asked, especially uh, when I entered the ministry. It's somewhat of an irony, I suppose. I'm often asked, what about children when they uh, die? The worst thing that any parent, grandparent, uh, anyone, none of us can bear the tragic loss of such a beautiful young child, especially knowing that we give God the glory for having created that child and have an intended purpose for their life and uh, entrusted them to us, and yet we live in this fallen, cursed world. But yet what seemed ironic to me is that I noticed people didn't walk into the emergency room and ask the ER doctor, what about locations in the world that don't have urgent care? I mean, why are we asking the people who are doing something about people who don't hear the gospel by preaching the gospel? Why do we ask the person who's doing the work to spread the gospel, to take the kingdom of God into all the world, to inbreak the monarchical reign of God? And that is the self ex- self-disclosed self expression of the monarchical reign of God as realized, revealed in the person Jesus the Christ. <clears throat> I mean, do we stop by and police station and say, what about communities that don't have access and the advantages of law enforcement in their community? I don't know. It seems odd to ask first. Uh, Do we ask teachers in our public schools and when we're there for open house? I've never overheard a uh, parent there to have a parent-teacher conference ask the teacher, uh, what about children in countries or nations or on remote locations on continents that lack resources and educational resources. I don't know how a teacher, a professional teacher who's completed design curriculum and is in the process of educating the children that are at hand to be educated, uh, would know how to respond. So before I respond as a pastor, I would just like to make it clear that we who have been entrusted the gospel of Christ first are not ashamed of the gospel. We don't modify the message, nor nor do we substitute it for a fallible religious construct so that somehow uh, we can go about assuming that a person has a fallible religious construct identity that like a cultural identity of yuppie, preppy, Gen Xer, boomer, hippie, millennial, blah, 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 that that might indicate something. It doesn't indicate a thing when someone says, I identify myself as a Calvinist or I identify myself as an Arminian or I identify myself as a traditionalist or a Molinist or a blah, blah, blahist. Uh, people in Catholic, Protestant, Judaic, Islamic, occultic, New Age, and denominational Uh, religious orders, uh, atheists, agnostics, anti-theists, whatever all those are, uh, it's irrelevant to those of us who preach the gospel. We um, are entrusted, Landmark Missionary Baptist Church, for example, as someone tried to say we were some type of brand of religion or something. I said, well, no, our name Baptist is not a denominational name. It is an accusation that we earn by our faithfulness to Christ to not seek licensure from both either from the state for preaching or for baptizing. The authority of our church, Landmark Missionary Baptist Church, is not extended to us by the state. It's an inalienable right entrusted us by Jesus the Christ, the head of our church. So answering the question as a pastor first is to first allow me the moment to pause and say, are you actually asking someone who's actively engaged, faithfully preaching the gospel and using every platform available to make sure people hear the gospel? Are you asking me, what about people who don't hear the gospel? And uh, more specifically, what about children who perish or die? Well, you're probably asking that question because you hear from uh, people who appropriate the uh, fallible religious construct identity Calvinism. And a good Calvinist, which I'm finding it hard to find very many, is willing to define, document, and disclose the fallible elements of his Calvinism that he supports, advocates, and prefers that you prefer it. Uh, And what I mean by that is, why would a person want our trust and gain our attention and want us to give our ear and listen to them when they themselves are admitting by their refusal to disclose fallible religious elements within their fallible religious construct, and they cannot, one, define, document, and disclose, or they will not, define, document, and disclose the fallible elements within it, then why should we trust them for anything else about it? And if anything about a fallible religious construct is actually the scriptures, then we'll just take the scriptures 
and the original context in which they're found, the original meanings that are eternal meanings that God always intended, and we'll just learn from that and move on. So you've probably been told by people, such as uh, in our church once we had a man that had somehow maneuvered into the position of a deacon, and he somehow advocated, and I guess he uh, had some investment in touting some form of Calvinism, uh, even uh, family members in the church would somehow give some uh, air of uh, arrogance or snobbery or supremacy or somewhat aloof, somehow saying um, people just don't get it. They just don't understand Calvinism. But they they would you know give the impression that somehow they had a handle on it. Well, they were just illiterate. They had not read the scriptures, and but for one of a text. Their assertions in Calvinism were quite valid as long as they remained between their ears and that those that they antagonized by it uh, just simply would assume that they weren't smart enough, I guess, to uh, know better. But since we do know better, and since the Lord's churches for 2,000 years of unbroken history, his churches are prevalent, like Jesus said, the gates of Hades will not prevail, and even that we're charged with secessionism, something like that, but we prefer the Bible word. We're prevalent, like Jesus said. So you've probably been told that why should children, you know, as Matt Slick of CARM.org said, C-A-R-M, that's Christian Apologetics Research Ministry, said, why should they get a pass? I mean, after all, <laughs> can you imagine in face of the loss of a child and the tragic death and the best thing an advocate of Calvinism can do is show that he has more interest in propping up his fallible religious construct than preaching the scriptures. There's a text in the Bible, if you would like to know it, it might help you. But in Deuteronomy 139, it says, Your children, which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil, they shall go in thither, and unto them will I give it, and they shall possess it. Now, he's speaking of the ones in the event called Kadesh Barnea, where those emancipated Hebrews came out, and after God had uh, performed the marvelous acts and miraculous deeds in Egypt, the plagues, as we call it, he then delivered them across through the Red Sea, that is, and they were all baptized into Moses. So yes, in the Old Testament, they were Baptist also. And it then says that when it came time for them to enter the Promised Land, they had evaluated it according to their own uh, self-appraisal of their own power, their own flesh, and their own feasibility study and research, which was striking. It so angered God that he swore in the day of his wrath they would never end. But he didn't say that about the children. He said they did not know, had no knowledge between good and evil. So if you don't get some principle from that, that God does not uh, find necessary children who have no knowledge between good and evil, he doesn't really need them for fodder and some fire. So uh, that verse would help you. And then also there was an account where Jesus saw his disciples trying to fence Jesus and bar children from coming to him. And it says, but when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not for of such is the kingdom of God. So Mark 10, 14, for example, in Deuteronomy 1, 39 but one religion has said this, and I, I do not blame people for being confused and distressed by what religious people say. This religion has put it this way. Whosoever will may come. Whosoever may will come. And whosoever will not cannot come. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I find it charming, the, the things men construct between their ears rather than um, uh supporting the context and that which God by Holy Spirit through Holy Spirit provided us to study and to read and to learn. But again, they've not been entrusted. That's the Lord's New Testament churches have been entrusted the Bible. That's why we're happy uh, to teach it. We don't support fallible constructs. And another uh, statement was we go out and we make disciples. We preach the gospel so that children, and I'm using children specifically, become converted to Christ. That is, they hear the gospel, they believe it, they're fathered through that gospel. And it says, then we move on to the disciple-making process. And there's a text here, Acts 14, 21, speaking of those who had preached the gospel 
to that city and made many disciples, they returned and, uh, but how'd they make that many disciples so quickly? Well, that's referring to that initial uh, act to initiate a student-teacher relationship by declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then it goes on that we do see children believe the gospel and we've never heard or read anywhere in the scriptures where someone who believed the gospel of Jesus Christ was not then therefore through that gospel fathered. Paul said, I fathered you all through the gospel. Uh, so we go on then and we uh, teach them. We give them scriptural baptism so they could sever their ties to that, their ties to that which Christ's blood had purchased them out from. Uh, as Paul said, we have been plucked out of this present evil age. So again, back to the original question so that I won't be remiss. I'm not sure uh, why people ask us who are preaching the gospel, that is. Um, what about people who have heard? It seems like that energy. And, and I think the question is consolatory and perhaps even somewhat exculpatory when they seek to exculpate themselves from their uh, opportunity that God's given them and trust to them to go out and preach the gospel and to make disciples. Because I, first of all, again, I'd just like to say that I've never had one of the pastors at Landmark for example, come up to me and say, uh, two, two sons of mine in the family and one in the faith. So there's three other pastors at Landmark. Now, they're multi-degree trained professionals. They're natives of the technology world, and they really have picked on me through the years, and I love it. But one of them, for example, who leads Core Neighborhoods, he, it, for each hour now, they've had 20 outings, and in this more strategic, more exponential initiative, because we promote exponential evangelism. They do 253 houses, door hangers on each house that has on it the outreach website, imcornay.org, the apologetic and outreach uh, website of Landmark Missionary Baptist Church, which is also linked to baptistlamp.org, which that website's just receiving uh, feedback from all over the world. It has books, it has blogs, we have videos, we have answers. Well, 253 per hour now. So they've done 5,065 in their first 20 outings under this exponential, more enhanced evangelistic effort, which reflects a continuous uh, review and revise that we do to always improve. And we do that for the sake of the gospel. But not one of the three pastors at Landmark have ever said, hey, what about people who've never heard? Our Corne sports director, who's developed all that himself, branded it all himself, done all the trademarking all himself, done all of our websites, and single-handedly uh, leads that. They do devotions during the week and present the gospel to children. They do uh, presentations of the gospel at the halftimes during their sports engagements. He's never approached me and said, Dear Father, what about people who've never heard the gospel? And then our uh, those involved in Corne Clubs, uh, the pastor, the son in the faith, if you will, who's grown upwardly at Landmark Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, he's now faithfully served for more of his lifetime than he's ever lived. He, he's never stopped and said, uh, oh, Pastor Carter, uh, what about people who never hear? Well, again, that would help first. From where does the question originate as we were taught in school uh, and when we do our hermeneutics, for example? It'd be nice to know who's speaking. Well, in this case, who's asking? And it's somewhat of an indictment to even ask the question because there seems to be some unresolved angst for a person. So it might be a unique way to approach this, and I don't mind doing that. But I would prefer the person to show some corresponding practice. If their orthodoxy is men need to hear the gospel, their orthopraxy should be then they seize every opportunity to go out and see to it that that's done. They don't seem to... Uh, we don't find people actively engaged in being faithful in, let's say, what we often hear, soul winning or now disciple making or in going out and initiating student teacher relationships. We don't find people faithful to that. And in that engagement, asking, uh, it's almost a vexation to the ones who are faithful. I was once asked that when we go out, are we seeking sheep or are we seeking to convert someone into a sheep? They really had me over a barrel there. That's the old Calvinism, Arminianism, real stale, low-informed answers and reasons. 
L-I-A-R-S. Uh, just an acronym to help remember. So I just, I had to answer like any wise pastor would. I just said, well, when we're out in the neighborhoods and we're going up and down the streets, uh, we've never had to pause and stand there and say, now just a minute, let's wait on the people that are seeking sheep to step away from the porch. And then, okay, now let's stop and wait on people who are seeking to convert people into sheep to step away from the porch. And now it's our turn. You know, I've never run into people out on the streets when we go do core neighborhoods. I've never run into uh, anyone reviewing, revising uh, their deliberate, strategic, evangelistic efforts to assure that they're increasing the exponential return on the invested energy. I've never seen people even care to resolve all the problems that men just continue to be uh, generating. Because how the real world that I originated from, if you were in a company, and all you could do is present another flummox, another problem, or in a factory where uh, production lines, all you could do is say, hey, I've got two bottlenecks here called Calvinism or Arminian, or I've created a bottleneck because no one can seem to navigate the gauntlet that I am so insistent on continuing to present to others. We'd have to let you go. <laughs> We'd have to let you go take your bottleneck somewhere else that has no interest in improving the productivity and the output and the quality of the product and services and assuring the safety of those involved. So first, the question, what about people have never heard, seems to be uh, we need to really go and do root cause analysis like John the Baptist said. There's an axe laid at the root here and there's an axeman who came and he felled all the trees and eventually there wasn't a stone remaining uh, in the uh, house of merchandise that they had converted the father's house into. Eventually, there wasn't anything left that had been propped up in those things constructed by the Pharisee, Sadducee, who later, if you read the text, they had come to be no longer capable of being demarcated or distinguished according to their fallible religious construct identities that they had so used to crush people and to manipulate people and to merchandise men. So we do root cause analysis. First, who's asking? And why are you asking? Are you worried because you're not involved? Are you anxious? Or are you prepared to do some type of harm to those of us that are asked? What's the right answer? So I'll give you the right answer. You who have believed the gospel, you who have trusted Christ, you who have come out and appropriated and recognize the kinsman redemption because you are now a child of God and that blood of Christ is applied to you as the kinsman redeemer. It's his prerogative and it's his, uh, he willingly took that obligation. The Bible says it behooved him. That was his, it says it was owing him, his character. Uh, he's expressed image. That's the word character. He's that one because of his character. It behooved him, obligated him to purchase with his blood and he chose voluntarily to do that. Um, so as his child, he met the obligation as a kinsman to apply that blood to you. And you come out, severed your ties, acknowledging no one between you and God, the Father of Jesus, except Jesus the Christ, just as they did in the Old Testament, no one between them and God, but Moses. He was the deliverer of, in type of the one who would come. He was the mediator of that old covenant. Uh, in type of the one that would come that was better, that would replace it and do away with it. So are you asking so that you don't know the answer? So I'll, I'll answer it. What would happen to you if you had not been a person to whom the gospel had been preached? And if you say, oh, well, it's no big deal to me, I would have just lived on with my life. So the gospel and being born again and the life in Christ, that new life we have here and now, is a nullity according to that type of answer. Or if you say, well, I would be without hope. I would have no uh, love, no joy, no peace, no patient endurance, no gentleness, no goodness, no meekness, no temperance, no faith. I would not have no joy of the Lord. I would not know what it is to be conformed to the image of Christ, which is that which takes place in, within the body of Christ, a local New Testament church strategically localized. Uh, you would never know what it is to move from a child to the sun place, to uh, rightfully demonstrate a competency, to be trusted, uh, the responsibilities in the father's house. You would never know what it is to be a godly mother, godly father. You'd never know what it is to be a godly husband, godly wife. You'd never know what it is to be a godly child obeying your parents. So let's just move on. What would happen to you if you had not 
heard the gospel. Well, then now we don't have to play. If you don't give the right answer, I will harm you. There's no injury and no harm that can befall a person in trust of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We bring life, life more abundantly. We preach Christ and him crucified. We preach that he became a curse on behalf of us and that he was hanged on the tree in our place. He's the substitute for our sins. Jesus Christ alone. So what can befall us? Nothing. Uh, throughout 2,000 years, uh, blood-bought baptized Baptists have gone out and preached and died as martyrs, not as jihadis who go out to inflict harm on others. We have never been part of any state-established uh, religions who are known for their notorious um, acts of persecution and employing state resources to force their dogma upon free citizens. We actually were instrumental in the disestablishment religion. So what happens to children? We already have the answer. Go to Deuteronomy 139. Go to Mark 10, 14. We already have the answers. What happens if someone doesn't hear the gospel? Because we know the answer if we hadn't heard the gospel. So if we have knowledge between good and evil, then we know it's good. As the Bible said, God told Cain, <clears throat> will you not have your countenance lifted if you cause yourself to do good, which is to believe the gospel, which is to preach the gospel, which is to encourage our neighbors to come out and identify with Christ through baptism, which is about the gospel, and to enter into a fellowship, being united to a body of Christ there in the particular community where you live, and then fellowship into that gospel. But since we enjoy exponential returns on the invested energies that we are asked to be stewards of at Landmark Missionary Baptist Church and have graciously been invited to ally ourselves with Landmark Media Productions and under guided research by people much wiser and who have been serving the Lord long before we came along. Uh, we, the pastors of Landmark Missionary Baptist Church, uh, myself and the other three uh, sons of mine in the family and in the faith, I have no... I have no... Uh, Nothing to say but gratitude for uh, older uh, pastors out there uh, who have suffered us to come unto them that we might learn how to do this work uh, for the sake of our neighbors more exponentially, how to do this work more efficiently, how to remove these bottlenecks of open and closed theism or uh, pre- and post-tribism and to remove these bottlenecks. And uh, But that's the truth. Uh, those who tout Calvinism, I, I'll take them seriously when they disclose through a willingness to define, document, and disclose the fallible elements of it. Uh, it's about integrity. It's about honesty. It's about a willingness to be truthful and rightly hand the Word of God. It's about not being a huckster. And I don't mean that there's people who appropriate Calvinism as their identity who are malicious or hucksters, but somewhere before you ask your neighbor to appropriate as well that viral, fallible religious construct, should you not take responsibility somewhere to evaluate it? Perhaps do confirmative evaluation, summative evaluation, formative evaluation, full scope evaluation? Maybe you should look up the meanings of the words. Maybe you should do lexical syntactical analysis. Maybe you should consider the context. Maybe the kinds of action which are emphasized, the kind of action which is emphasized by the Corne text. Maybe you should look at the inflectional morphemes of the biblical Hebrew and maybe make those relevant and relieve your neighbor of the angst of having to rationalize some fallible religious construct with the context that he finds himself reading that finds no correlated reality between the two. So that's a good answer. Uh, you, you have no concerns about children or anyone that has no knowledge between good and evil. Uh, we have no uh, unanswered question about what happens if people don't hear the gospel because first the person asking hasn't yet uh, given us a rationale for the question. Are you wanting to come on board with our outreach? I haven't seen that. Are you saying you think you would like to make a large contribution so that our evangelistic efforts can even be multiplied more? I haven't seen that. And when people ask me about, are you seeking sheep or are you seeking to convert people into sheep? It's because they don't know the difference between 
the term sozo and ganao. One is generate and one is to deliver. So we know it's a question that comes from ignorance. It can also come from some who have a hardened heart and others uh, who are void of Christ's spirit. And even more regrettably, uh, those who, like inquisitors, just seek to ascertain something, then they can impugn us that are the objects of their query so that by diminishing us, they can feel better. So they just seek to exculpate themselves through a consolatory story and say, my, can you believe uh, that preacher is a Calvinist? And being accused of being a Calvinist is the most comical thing I've ever heard. And being accused of being an Arminian is even more comical. Or now a traditionalist or a Molinist or whatever. Uh, it, it's really embarrassing because I can tell you why more people haven't heard the gospel. Because people's flesh, for those who've rejected it, who deliberately cause themselves to disbelieve into Christ in order that they might be justified out from his faithfulness, they, by having done that, will forever seek to justify themselves and persuade others like themselves that aren't we right to transfer a concern over to someone else? Aren't we right to uh, feign or pretend, most people don't know what feign is, but to pretend an angst and a grief because we're not sure if that pastor gave us the right answer. Which pastor, I would ask? Oh, the one faithful to preach the gospel. <laughs> Yeah, people, our inquisitors are always dull. They're just not quite, can't, they just can't get those wires to connect. And I would just like to end it by saying I would rather introduce their right brain to their left brain and uh, see them uh, stop the silliness and then do as Jesus taught us. Just let's preach them the truth, the unconcealment, so that the cloak of their sin, which is indifference toward obedience to Christ and his great commission, uh, these people aren't faithful in one of the Lord's churches. Uh, they're not holding fast their profession through baptism. They're not faithful in the fellowship into the gospel. Uh, they're not actively engaged in the Great Commission of making disciples of all the nations. Uh, they don't care about context, lexography. They don't care to even know people who do care about those things. So uh, I hope that's relieved those of you who uh, do enjoy seeing how great God is in his exponential return on his word as it goes out. And I, for one, as pastor of Landmark Missionary Baptist Church that fully and faithfully gathers for every purpose for which God has intended us to gather at 2200 Marshall Road. I'm very grateful to be in an alliance of associated brethren and associated churches and associated uh, uh, great commission endeavors, if you will, such as Landmark Media Productions, BaptistLamp.org, Lamp Theological Institute, IamCornet.org, Cornet University, Cornet Neighborhoods, KLASS Class, Cornet Leadership Attitude, Student Success. I'm very encouraged to be part of uh, our uh, Cornet Commission where we go out to initiate uh, dialogue, conversations. We're commissioned to converse very grateful for the Cornet Project. I'm very grateful for all those who've helped resource this so that I don't really have colleagues or friends in the ministry who ask silly questions because we are far beyond those matters with which so many childish ones and disobedient ones preoccupy themselves. But if you've ever been harmed and been distressed because people will crush you with some fallible religious construct and almost condemn you as though somehow what they're adamantly affirming is infallible. Well, be, here's good news. Uh, children, children by definition, those who do not know the difference between good and evil, uh, there's, no, there's nothing to concern ourselves with except to receive the grace from God to cope and to grieve their loss in this life. What a tragedy. I, I can't know something worse, more severe than the loss of a child. And I don't know families who've lost children who know of anything more severe. So with that good news, uh, continue to preach the good news, preach the gospel, and certainly enjoy the truth 
of the freedom we have in Christ, and we will all do as Christ told us, stand fast in the freedom wherein we've been called. So you have a blessed day, and if you have any more angst out there, anyone at Landmark Missionary Baptist Church can help you. If you have never been scripturally baptized, for example, you might not have ever heard the gospel, that there's no such thing as faith into Jesus Christ in order that you might be justified out of the faithfulness of Christ plus something else. If you've never believed into Jesus Christ with the purpose, as the Bible says, that those who believed into him, uh, they'll be declared justified, declared right out from his faith, his faithfulness. Uh, those are much more concrete terms and demonstrable as the love of God, the Bible says. He demonstrates his love for us. So if you've never heard that gospel or you've been taught a gospel where uh, you're assured you lose, you're assured you are losing, you're assured once lost, you're always being lost, you're assured that it's just something you could take or leave, forfeit, for example. If you've ever been taught that different gospel, it's by a different spirit and it's another Jesus. So if you've you're wrong on the gospel. You won't have baptism. So whatever you did was just get wet. As people who uh, have, were faithful to teach me that if you've never believed the gospel, you weren't fathered through the gospel. The blood of Christ never applied to you. Blood's always before uh, baptism. Christ always before uh, the church. Christ the person. So you believe into Christ the person. We'll baptize you into Christ. That is the assembly. And yet, if you don't have baptism. You don't know, probably never heard of anti-typical immersion, uh, which uh, the stipulation of that is a clear conscience before God. And that's by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So if you don't have this newness of life, you certainly have never been led by the spirit that leads all of us who've been generated, fathered through the gospel to come out and sever our ties. Unless you want to join those in the Old Testament who never crossed the Red Sea. And of whom, whoever those people are, I have no knowledge in the Bible who they are. And whatever they are, uh, apparently they didn't have the blood applied to the doorpost. Apparently, those who don't seek baptism, because you'll find people arguing about baptism as um, baptismal regeneration. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. It didn't say regenerated. That's already taken place. So... That antitypical immersion is very, very important. It's just as important as people who embarked the ark and how that flood took everyone else away. And even those who were regenerated but had walked away from that uh, covenant, that complete generation in which Noah and his family continued to be faithful. So I, I for one, as a pastor of one of the Lord's New Testament churches, can tell you there are no benefits they're unto appertaining outside the new covenant in this life. And there's nothing but great shame in the thousand year reign on this earth that we look forward to as we learn to reign here and now on the earth in this. That is what we call the self-disclosed expression of the monarchial reign of God as God revealed that through his son, Jesus the Christ. He's the head of our church. Uh, we don't have a mysterious concept of God's kingdom because we have Jesus directly immediately as the king of Landmark Missionary Baptist Church. His teachings are our uh, rule of faith and practice. His new covenant in his blood is that which we commemorate and memorialize. So having spoken far too long, I hope that this has helped you. And I certainly know it's encouraging to me when I hear feedback of people who are very grateful that someone just bothers to tell them this originally started to help people in Landmark Missionary Baptist Church as the computer and social media and whatever all these things are began to be somewhat of a source of inundation of skewed information. So I only did it initially as I should have said only but primarily to help alleviate the angst in the local congregation uh, but we've noticed several people uh, involved and interested in our videos in our ministry and we're happy for them to engage us and give us feedback and even express their intolerance for us, and some express their tolerance because we'll always prefer that which is better, which is freedom. And we want to give them that freedom, but we will assure you there is no freedom outside of Christ. So you have a blessed day and enjoy these good answers.